Hey, seventh grade. So apparently Mrs. Trottle has just learned about the secret to have Raymond join the island. And so she's going to try to escape with him so that Raymond doesn't go to the island and leave her. And this is where we left off. The search for Raymond went on all that day and well into the next. Everyone helped. The ghosts of the gump got in touch with the ghosts in all the other railway stations. And soon there wasn't a train which drew out of London without a specter gliding down the carriages looking for a fat boy with a wobble in his walk and even a wobbly mother. The mermaids and the water nymphs chucked out the river boats in case the trottles meant to escape by the sea. The enchanter's special pigeons flew the length and the breadth of the land, delivering notes to road workers and garage men who might have seen the trottle's car. And the train spotter called Brian, the one who got between the buffers and the 915 from Peterborough, sat all day by the computer at Heathrow checking the passenger list through electricity, though electricity is about the worst thing that can happen to a specter's ectoplasm. Ben had not returned to school after Oj came for him. He asked the headmaster for the afternoon off. And because he looked so peaky when he first came, the head had agreed. Don't come back until you're properly well, he had said. And that was something he didn't say to a lot of children. But though Ben searched Trottle Towers for clues and tried to get what he could out of the servants, he too drew a blank. Mr. Trottle returned at lunchtime with a locksmith and told everyone that his wife and son would be away for a long time, and that was all anybody could discover. Ben's first thought was that Mrs. Trottle had taken Raymond to her home in Scotland, but one of the banshees who came from Ga Ga Glasgow telephoned the station master at Achnesheen, and he swore there was no sign of the Trottles. You'd notice them soon enough, he said, with their posh kilts they've got no right to wear and their bossy ways. The rescuers had returned to the summer house, which now became the headquarters of the search. They had bought some blankets and a primus and a kettle and some folding chairs, and Hans had painted up the notice saying private, no admittance, which blocked the path. Fortunately, the headkeeper was on holiday, so nobody disturbed them. But just to make sure, Gurky had spoken to the bushes that grew so thick and tangled that anybody passing by could see nothing. She had planted out the beetroot from her hat because people did seem to stare rather, and to stop it being lonely, she had made a vegetable patch from which huge leeks and lettuces erupted. And a pink begonia on the other side of the lake had made such a fuss because it wanted to be near her that she moved it so that it would grow beside the wooden steps. But even though she could feed everyone and make them comfortable, Gurky still worried dreadfully and thought that she should have been a fowl. No, you shouldn't, Gurky, said Ben firmly. Being a fuath, <laughs> whatever that is, is a perfectly horrible idea and it wouldn't have helped at all. Nor would he let the giant moan on because he hadn't bopped and sacked the prince. Raymond will be found. I'm absolutely sure of it, said Ben. Ben was changing, thought Odge. He was becoming someone to rely on. She watched as he put down a bowl of milk for the mistmaker. The animal had taken to lurching after Ben whenever he went and making offended noises when he wasn't immediately scratched on the stomach or picked up and spoken to. There was going to be a fuss from the mistmaker when they had to go back and part from Ben, thought Odge and she wondered whether she should kill Ben's grandmother. Killing people was the sort of thing that hags were meant to do, but it hadn't been allowed on the island, and without any practice, it was probably a bad idea. But what mattered now was finding Raymond. All that afternoon, all evening, and well into the night, they searched and searched. The wizards and the witches, the ghosts and the banshees and the trolls, and as soon as day broke, they began again but it was beginning to look as though Raymond and his mother had vanished from the face of the earth. Chapter 11. The queen leant out her bedroom window. She leant out so far that she would have fallen, but for a dwarf whom the king had put in charge of holding her feet. He had been holding her feet for days now because she did nothing except look out to the sea and watch for the three-masted ship. Oh, where is it? She said for the hundredth time. Why doesn't it come? 
there were men all over the island peering through telescopes, the dolphins searched the seas, the talking birds, the minas and the parrots were never out of the air. The instant the ship was sighted, rockets would flare up, but the queen went on watching, her long hair streaming over the sill as though by doing so, she could will her son to come to her. But the dwarf now sighed, he was growing tired, and the queen dragged herself away and went into the next room, which she had prepared for the prince. His old white curtain cradle still stood in the corner, but the palace carpenters had made him a beautiful bed of cedar wood and a carved desk and a bookcase because she knew without being told that the prince would love to read. She hadn't made the room fussy, but the carpet with its pattern of mythical beasts and flowers had taken seven years to make. And there was a wide window seat so that he could sit and look out over the waters of the bay. But would he ever sit there? Would she ever come in and see his bright head turn towards her? The king coming into the room found her in tears again. Come, my dear, he said, putting his arms around her. There are five days still for the rescuers to bring him back. But the queen wouldn't be comforted. Let me go to the secret cove at least, she begged. Let me wait there for him. The king shook his head. What can you do there, my love? You'd only fret and worry and your people need you. I would be closer to him. I would be near. The king said nothing. He was afraid of letting his wife go near the mouth of the gump. If she lost her head and went through it, he could lose her as he had lost his own son. Try to have patience, he begged her. Try to be brave. The king and queen were not the only people on the island to worry and grow afraid. The school children had been given a holiday during nine days of the opening, but they had decorated the school with flowers and hung up banners saying, Welcome to the prince. Now the flowers were wilting. The banners hung limp after a shower of rain. The bakers who had baked huge three-tiered cakes for the welcoming banquet began to prod them with skewers, wondering if they were going to go stale and if they should start again. The housewives who had ironed their best dresses shook them out and ironed them all over again because they'd grown crumpled. As for the nurses in the cave, they had ordered a crate of green bananas before the opening so that the second ship was sighted, they could rip it open and help themselves to the firm, just ripened fruit. But now, when no news came, they nailed it up again, and now they were wailing and eating burnt toast. Then, that night, the square began to fill up with some very strange people. There had been rumors, quite early on, of discontent in the north of the island. Not just the kind of grumbling you always get from people who have not been chosen for a job they are, they are sure they could do. Not just Aja's sisters complaining because their baby sister had been chosen and not them. Not just grumpy giants saying what you'd expect, sending a milksop who yields who yodels to bring back the prince. No, this was more serious discontent and from creatures that were to be reckoned with. And that evening, the evening of the fourth day of the opening, they came. These discontented people of the north, they came in droves, filling the grassy square in front of the palace and turned their faces up to the windows and waited. Strange faces they were too, the blue-black faces of the neckties with their lopsided feet, the slavering tongue, tongue sky yelpers, those airborne hellbounds with their saucer eyes and fiery tongues, and the squint-eyed faces of the harridans. There were hags in the square who made Aja's sisters look like tinsel fairies. There was a bagworm as long as a railway carriage. There was even a brolichon, one of those shapeless blobs who crawl over the ground like cold jellies and can envelope anyone who gets in their way. And there were the harpies. They had elbowed their way to the front, these monstrous women with wings and claws of birds and even the fiercest creatures who waited with them gave them wide berth. All right, guys, this is where we're going to stop for today. Uh, tune in, click on the link for tomorrow, and we'll read a little bit more. Bye, guys.